All right, Bernard, you want to take us away? Sure. Uh, this is the March meeting of the Weber to see working group. Next slide. Harold won't be with us. He's on vacation. Uh, we have our IPR policy, which we abide by, and only people and companies that are listed on the page are able to make substantive contributions. And uh, you muted yourself, Bernard. Time management is important because we've got a lot of things on the agenda. So uh, please try to keep within the time. And then we have meetings scheduled for uh, once a month for the next few months. Next slide. Okay, uh, slides are published on the wiki. Do we have a scribe? I'll do it. Thanks, Tom. And of course, the reporting will be public. Next. We have a code of conduct. Please keep it cordial and confidential. Next. And uh, I think we all know uh, how to do this, but please raise your hand to get into the queue and lower it to get out and wait for microphone access. And please do not jump the queue. Thanks. Uh, I won't talk about document status next. OK, so here's what's on the agenda. We got Tim for uh, 13 minutes, I guess now. And then Ewan's going to talk about reactions. Uh, then Yanivar will do media capture specs. We'll have Guido on RTC, RTP, sender, encoder, source, and then uh, send the use cases at the end. Next. OK. Uh, all right. So I'm going to try to be a virtual Tim Patton unless there's a real one here. Um, and, and basically, the issue here is alternative storage for RTC certificates. Next slide. OK. So um, RTC certs are a medium term identity uh, persistence mechanism. So there is some concern about fingerprinting. Uh, it's between peers because it's used in DTLS and other things. Um, it, this doesn't relate to centralized identity. Um, it is Im important to have it in case you have outages or IoT or stuff like this. Uh, next. So uh, in theory, it could be valid up to a year, but um, sometimes the expiry isn't checked. Uh, and then the question is, how do you store it? You can do that in IndexedDB, but if you wipe the IndexedDB, it gets lost. And uh, Safari, uh, because of their interest in privacy, they wipe the IndexedDB after a week. And sometimes users wipe it uh, to get prices and, and stuff like that. So the question is whether there's an alternative. Next. So I guess proposal one is uh, to save to the index DB store. I guess that's where we put media key session. Um, and uh, you could do it that way. Um, and under the fingerprint, so you'd need another fingerprint to, to retrieve it. Um, I guess uh, next is proposal two is uh, to export to a blob to allow the user app to save it. So this would be save it some other place um, and then do something with it. But um, generally not a great practice. We don't like to uh, expose the keys in JavaScript. In fact, I think we're been pretty adamant about that. Uh, but then again, there's the end end implementations. So uh, I don't know, the question is are people willing to reconsider? Next. Well, uh, since we're trying to figure out what to do here, are there other proposals? I guess I lots of, if you have an idea, it would be welcome. Um, to leverage client certs. So I think at this point, maybe uh, we'll open it to discussion. Yuen, do you have any thoughts? Um, 
to it seems the only solution would be uh, a way to extract the information uh, get get it accessible from the web page and then the web page can store it on the cloud and then the web page has when it's reloaded it has to be able to access to that storage somehow so the user needs to identify it himself and so on and then you you, you get it again so I, I'm not sure in the case where you're trying to to be uh, fully disconnected it's it's helping much because if you're already able to do that maybe you're able to set up a new connection with new credentials and so on so uh, I, I would tend to not expose these key materials to JavaScript. That's uh, a principle we we have from the past, and I, I'm not sure that breaking that principle uh, will help. Will definitely help Tim's use case. So, but uh, Tim is not there. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So the, I guess the idea wouldn't be to do proposal two, but something. Yeah, the question is what you could do along those lines that wouldn't have all the security implications. Yeah, in, in terms of privacy, if you're able to keep it a, a longer lifetime, uh, then you're decreasing privacy. So that's not very appealing to, to us, at least. So we, we would need to, to keep it in a way where privacy would be preserved, and I don't see how we can manage both. Anyone else have any good ideas? Well, only to say that uh, this isn't my area of expertise, but I agree that exposing keys to JavaScript is not the takeaway we should have from our end-to-end -end experiments. Um, and that we still hope to someday rectify that. If Eric or Scorla were here, I know what he would say. Right. Probably punch me in the face virtually. <laughs> Just trying to even think about who we ask. Dom? But uh, I think at the end of the day, coming up with a new way of storing persistent data that indeed doesn't break some of the uh things we're trying to fix with uh other storages feels pretty challenging at a high level so uh, i understand the concern but i'm not sure we there is a sweet spot for a solution here i don't want to blow tim off though i think this is a serious problem um yeah yeah d definitely i, um, I, I think bring it to i think chrome has this concept of persistent storage where there's a prompt and then you can somehow extend the lifetime of some things. Uh, I don't think it's available in Safari and I'm not sure whether we, what's our take on, on that particular API, but, but I think there's something there in the storage, uh, storage stack. I don't know if it's there. Yeah, there's this uh, navigator storage dot persisted and uh, dot persist. Um, so may maybe Tim could, could look at that. And that's one way of uh, that would solve these things. Although I don't think it's implemented in, in Safari. So what working group? Did that come out of? Uh, it's um, it's what what wg. It's uh, storage dot tech dot what wg dot org. Uh, I will pass the link on the chat. So, uh, Dom, what might be the follow up items here? Oh. Uh, well, again, with our team here, it's a bit hard to say, but I would suggest that he maybe explores whether the uh, persistent storage API would be a solution uh, than, of course, 
the question is whether it would also get adopted in all browser engines, but uh, at least at the moment, that seems maybe the best path to explore, rather than start from scratch on reconciling persistent storage and privacy. Okay, I guess that's the best we have to offer. Um, so yeah, let's make sure we have good minutes and we can talk to Tim and figure out where to go from here. All right, next item. UN reactions. Okay, next slide. Um, so we, this topic came uh, a few times and so we, we finally shared an issue in media capture extensions. Um, so in, in some OSs like macOS and <coughs> for instance, there'll be ability for users to uh, trigger reactions. And this happens at the OS level. So it's not under the control of the, of the user agent or the web page, basically. And it's, uh, it's super useful. Some people are crazy about it. They really think it's fun and, and so on, and it's, it's great. Uh, but in, in some contexts, uh, it's not as fun. So in this discussion, the scope is really uh, uh, the effects that are triggered by user gesture, like uh, this thing there. Maybe it will work. No, well, it's not working. Anyway, um, it, what is noticed in scope is if the user is actually selecting in the OS uh, specific reactions that happen, because there's, there's a a, a user gesture, so it's really clear that the user wants the effect. That, uh, like, if you, yeah, Yoniva, you got it. <laughs> uh, so, next slide. So we are really talking about reactions that are triggered by uh, some uh, heuristics, not triggered by the user actually selecting a specific uh, um, uh, effect. So it's, it's really fun and it's useful in many contexts, uh, like in WebRTC interims, where we can have a lot of fun with Johnny Var. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, there are some contexts where it's not super useful and telehealth is one of them where, um, and, and there are some articles that uh, mention that. So what I think, we, so we got some feedback and what I think web applications want is uh, first to provide hints to the user agent that just the reactions are welcome, are useful in the web app context, or, or they're not. And that's the scope of this proposal. Uh, web applications might also want to be aware that reactions uh, may be added upon user gesture. So it's uh, the OS, is, the user agent is actually computing some uh, heuristics and may insert some uh, reactions. And if the web application knows it, maybe if, if the web application does not want it, it, the web application can notify the user, hey, are you sure with this setting? Um, the third thing is that maybe reactions, uh, the web application might want to be aware that reactions are added to specific video frames. Uh, I know that it's used by some, uh, web applic some applications uh, to tune the encoding, because if you have these uh, reactions, the encoding uh, it's very different and you can change the parameters. So it might be useful to have this, this info. Um, it's not in scope today, though it could be a future video metadata attached to video frame, not in scope uh, for today. So next slide. Um, so hopefully we, we agree on uh, what the web apps want. And if so, there's a proposed solution. So my question will be, are you okay with us solving that and is the proposed solution uh, a good idea? Um, so the proposed solution here is uh, to replicate what we've done with background blur. Uh, background blur is again uh, uh, an effect that the OS can do and uh, web application can, can know about. So it's a, it would be a Boolean constraint. It would be a Boolean capability and a Boolean setting. Uh, it would be like, so the contract mechanism is really flexible. 
because it allows user agent to expose whether reactions are on or off. And also, depending on what the OS provides, the user agent can expose whether web application can turn on or turn off the reactions themselves. Um, so it should be flexible enough to cover uh, different OS um, designs. And uh, yeah, with these mechanisms, with the constraints and so on, the web application can provide to the user agent uh, whether reactions are desired. So Telehealth would typically say, okay, I, I, I do not expect reactions to be on. And then the user agent can either turn that off, turn that on, provide hints to the user, whatever is, uh, is available. Um, so Yoniva made a proposal. It's a PR 141, and it's along the route lines, like, like a Boolean constraint. The name of a particular constraint is under discussion. Uh, this topic is not about this today, uh, although maybe if we all agree, we can uh, uh, try to have suggestions there. Um, so now uh, I'm opening the floor. Um, is the working group okay with uh, providing a solution to that space? And if so, is this Boolean constraint capability setting uh, a good enough solution? Thoughts? I see picnic on the queue. Uh, that would be me. Uh, so definitely, uh, thank you very much. I think this is a great uh, solution for a very significant problem. So uh, thank you for uh, presenting and thank you, Yanivar, for the PR. And uh, my only question is, when can we have that? Like, uh, is macOS going to make the necessary changes in any upcoming thing? Or is that something that you guys are not comfortable communicating yet? So there are, there are two things. The first thing is that there's an API that allows to know whether the OS, uh, is a, whether reactions are enabled or not. So this, with the current macOS support, uh, with this constraint, you can uh, allow the web page to know whether reactions are on or off, which yeah. is uh, already an improvement. Uh, currently, it's not possible I don't think it's possible for uh, the user agent to provide a hint or to disable or enable uh, reactions. Um, it's it's early to uh, to provide uh, um, feedback on this. But that's something we are considering. Uh, so while I theoretically agree that if the application knows uh, if the reactions might be on. Uh, is an improvement. I think that it's a very minor improvement. I don't really know what the application could credibly do to use this information. I'm not opposed to it in any way, uh, but the real interesting part uh, for us uh, is to know to actually be able to uh, to turn it on or off. Uh, we're in complete agreement that if the user delivers a very explicit interaction with the operating system or any other upstream entity and clicks and wants to inject that uh, uh, gesture, that's fine. Uh, but the heuristic nature of the gestures means that it misfires a lot and it misfires uh, sometimes disastrously for users. Uh, so very supportive of standardizing the way to deal with that. And if you're able to communicate how quickly we can actually implement that in macOS, like implement it in browsers run, running on top of macOS, that would be also very interesting for us to know. Um, yeah, talking about schedules and so on, that will be difficult. But uh, any, anyway, um, I think the, the current design is that uh, the OS, is, the user is deciding, and it, the user might enable or disable it uh, on the fly. Uh, so it's it's already a nice improvement for the web page to know that. And uh, then the web page, uh, which might be uh, very interested in turning that on or turning that off, we'll be able to provide uh, guidelines uh, to the user to enable it or, or on or off through the OS. That's, uh, that's the first step. Uh, I understand that next steps would be uh, good to have. Uh, I don't think that for this proposal, it will change anything. This proposal is flexible enough so that uh, the more the OS is, is providing in terms of flexibility, uh, the more will be uh, use, usable and useful uh, for this uh, particular proposal. But it, it will not change how we would design this uh, particular proposal. 
So it's a I agree. Uh, so I agree that theoretically applications might use this information to communicate to the user uh, that there is an issue, but uh, in my experience with video conferencing applications, they have so many things that they want to communicate to the user and very little time to distract the user. So I'm afraid uh, that we will go through a lot of work to actually, not a lot of work, but some work to expose this and end up seeing that no web application actually uses that. Uh, so while I support this, I encourage you uh, to, to go to the next step as well and not stop there. That's all, so uh, thank you very much. All right. Uh, I, I had one comment. Uh, since I'm next on the queue, just that I'm supportive of this, of this as well, and I think uh, at, this sounds very similar to background blur. I don't know if background background blur in this is in the same situation that if applications can change black turn that on and off. But in any case, this is the seems to be the logical step. And uh, in adding this API, we remove an obstacle toward uh, making this functionality available both with immediate benefit uh, for read-only, but also read-write in the future. So I'm supportive. Sounds good. So uh, is there anybody else on the queue? No one on the queue. OK. So it seems that the room is considering that we should go forward with the proposal and I think, are we okay with the editors uh, finding or fighting for the right name? In the mud? <laughs> In the virtual world, yeah. Uh, I'm a bit out of shape this season, so I would prefer if we uh, did not fight, but otherwise, yes, I'm okay with the editors uh, uh, taking this on. Sounds good. If there is a mud fight, it has to be recorded. <laughs> Here's a revenue stream we've not thought of previously, right? To finance this work. Okay, so let's add that to uh, to the to the logs, and uh, I guess we can go to the next topic. Okay, that's me. <clears throat> All right. So. Um, Let's see. So we have uh, I have a segment here to cover a couple of media capture specifications. Uh, and uh, right now, uh, I have mostly two issues uh, to talk about. One is to finish up the uh, mute unmute cleanup across spec. And uh, the second one, if we have time, is uh, a small issue about media capture record. So <clears throat> uh, last meeting, we we're able to make progress and merge issue uh, 984 eventually uh, to clarify that each source for a camera or microphone is responsible for specifying mute, unmute, and ended behaviors as well as constraint behaviors. So this is a, a spec cleanup to remove any implicitly inherited behaviors across specs uh, by requiring each spec that defines a source of a new media stream track to follow a new section we added 17.4, uh, defining a new source of media stream, stream track. That includes declaring which constrainable properties, uh, if any, are applicable to each kind of media this new source produces and how they work. Uh, describe how and when to set the tracks muted state for this source and describe how and when to end tracks from this source. So uh, as part of merging the new language in media capture main, uh, we just, uh, it was decided that I had to open uh, issues on each source to review mute, ended, and constraints behavior. And so I, I did that uh, last month. And so now we're just going to go through and, and check in on each of these. And I've made a slide for each one. They're not necessarily in this order, so my apologies. <clears throat> So the first one to, uh, I'd like to talk about is get display media, uh, which appears to be in good shape. <clears throat> um, get display media seems to be using mute, unmute, mostly for closed and minimized display surfaces. But the actual language is a little more specific. Um, 
It can become inaccessible to applications because of actions taken by the operating system or user agent. What is considered inaccessible is outside the scope of the spec, but examples may include a monitor disconnecting, window or browser closing, or becoming minimized or due to an incoming call on the phone. <clears throat> Uh, so my reading of this language is that it it, it seems while it doesn't call out an explicit example, um, this seems to satisfy satisfy ideas like the toggle screen share, uh, user agent toggle that's been proposed in media session, and uh, you can see the actual language here as well. Um, this would basically be an inaccessible state as uh, basically induced by the user agent. Um, and then 5.4 covers all constrainable properties already that are specific to uh, display capture. <clears throat> so my proposal is to close this as reviewed, optionally adding a PR to include the UA uh, privacy toggle among the examples. Any thoughts on this one? Um, I'm okay with closing it as reviewed. All right, great. Any other thoughts? All right, great, I'm moving on. <clears throat> the next one is uh, WebRTC peer connection. Uh, here we have a section 9.3 that specifies that mute is from RTCP by and some cases of set remote description to inactive and send only. <clears throat> and unmute happens from incoming RTP. Uh, and the end of the event is fired when you stop a transceiver basically. Uh, and there's some negotiation cases where that information is uh, the stop. We have a stopping and stop uh, details around where the stop information state is uh, negotiated. <clears throat> and then we have uh, media stream tracks. Uh, sorry, we have uh, constraints covered by 931. Uh, but the state of implementation is here, uh, which is from a duplicate issue 2915. Uh, I, I did some tests and uh, determined that there's some deviations here. Uh, Firefox appears to follow 9.3. Uh, Safari browser deviates by uh, in two ways, which is unmute after one millisecond, which is likely ahead of RTP reception because it takes about 32 milliseconds in Firefox. But there's a WebKit bug for that. Uh, mute, it also mutes tracks on stop transceivers. Oh, wait, muting tracks on stop transceivers. It doesn't do that. But I don't have, I think there's a WebKit bug for that. Um, and Chrome deviates by, oh, sorry, I misspoke. So mute tracks should not be muted on the stop transceiver. It should be ended. So that's maybe a small detail, but it's like, it's good to get these behaviors uh, aligned across browsers. Uh, Chrome deviates by unmuting ahead of RTP incoming RTP. Uh, I didn't measure it, but it's, be, it's ahead of set the most description, but there's a CR bug for that. And uh, let me just do the last one. Chrome also mutes uh, video tracks, not only tracks, but video tracks about one second after sender track stop, which is different from transceiver stop. This is just the sender side uh, stopping a media stream track that happens to be the currently sent um track and that should not uh, cause muting according to the spec because you can do replace track and other things and also that's not how it's defined so but there's a cr bug for that so overall i gave this a green checkbox because bugs are filed on all ua specific behaviors except for the one webkit bug that i couldn't find uh un yeah um i think it's a bug for uh, muting tracks on stop transceiver uh, uh I'm, I'm surprised. I, I would hope there's a WPT task. Uh, if not, we should definitely uh, write one. Um, <clears throat> with regards to unmuting after one millisecond or ahead of RTP uh, reception, um, if you wait to unmute when receiving the first RTP packet, there's a potential raciness between uh, changing the mute state and uh, getting the first video frame. So you could well end up in a situation where the first video frame is decoded, is sent 
while you're you're uh, you're, you're you're still think that you're muted basically. Um, so I don't know how Firefox is doing there, but uh, I, I'm wondering how much it helps to do this thing where you wait for the first packet and then you unmute. And the same for audio where you, well, you, you might have the JITA buffer, but uh, anyway, if you, so I, 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 I'm wondering whether that's a good idea to uh, this uh, RTP reception thing. And it does not seem that anybody, it does not seem they are interrupt there. So I, I'm wondering whether we can change things there and simplify things. Um, on this area. Okay. Uh, we should probably file an issue then, uh, since that would be changing ex existing language in the spec. Uh, and that's okay to have as an outcome from a review like this. Uh, specifically, though, I don't, I'm not aware that Firefox suffers any visible or noticeable, noticeable issue. But I think in general, any event that fires on main thread, uh, you, if you have a uh, a lot of activity on main thread, for example, it, in any event like this, it's going to be put on on a pretty busy queue. So relying on uh, events to fire on main thread. Uh, so it, it'd be good to avoid situation. That's another reason why doing media stuff on the main thread is actually not a good idea. So I think our design hopefully prevents that as much as possible where uh, something has to fire on main thread. Um, but um, it'd be good to measure if this can actually happen. Um, by the time an RTP packet comes, I'm, I'm assuming there's some work to be done before that is turned into a uh, consumable frame, for example, a jitter buffer and those kind of things. So I don't actually know if that's an issue and in, 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 uh, that can happen. So maybe we should take a, open an issue and try to do some experiments to see if, if that problem uh, can manifest or not. Um, OK, in any case, um, the proposal here is to close this after reviewed and to also close 2915, um, since uh, no implementation defined behavior. Or, or you know, we maybe we should leave 2915 open then to explore the unmuting case for RTP packets. Or you um, do you want to open a separate issue for that? I think it's a pretty sweet bidder. Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Because the goal of this review is mostly to remove implementation defined behavior. If we want to change the you know spec behavior, that's that's a good separate issue, I think. Sounds good. Any other thoughts on this one? All right. Uh, I'm uh, not hearing I just I just wonder what the Chrome team is thinking about uh, Sierberg uh, 9.4.17.40, about muting and unmuting based on video frames. Is it, uh, well, we, we might have already discussed this, I guess, but uh, any any feedback there or any thoughts? Uh, which bug is that? Or issue uh, or? It's the, uh, um, Muting, upon muting a, re, um, a remote track when a sender track stop is called, which is CR bug nine four one seven four zero. And I guess if yeah, if uh, if there's no packets, I guess that's as well. I, I guess that covers behavior that was inherited from from the language in the main spec. So we need to. Uh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. We need to, to look at it to see if if it uh, if fixing it will will actually break applications that might be relying on on the original parent spec language. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think uh, that that shouldn't block this this uh, uh, this, the, this spec change or the, the spec purification because uh, uh, the spec was said some of these things but not not all of them clearly so so uh, i think that the spec clarification is correct i agree uh, now the fix chrome to complete like this uh, we have to check because it's implementing an older version of the spec 
don't say. So, uh, but, yeah. but uh, so we'll need to experiment, look uh, the, the, the developers and so on to, to see how, how we can uh, fix that part. But yeah, but, uh, but, yeah, but uh, I wouldn't be opposed to, to making this change. Okay, that, that sounds good. Uh, if you if you see some difficulties in in making that change, it would be good to to get that feedback as well because maybe uh, it's uh, it's if we are not getting web compact there, it, it might be harm, harmful for either Chrome or Safari or Firefox. So getting to know that it's whether it's an actual issue or not would be uh, would be very valuable feedback. Yeah, that would be the next step. So, but I think this shouldn't block making these these changes all right okay that that sounds good and yes the web compact was my concern as well so i was hoping since it's only happened on video tracks as far as i was able to observe anyway that uh this would be something that uh, applications well i guess applications may still be relying on it uh for video and not for audio it, it's, uh, so it definitely be something that'd be nice to clean up if possible all right. Any other thoughts on this? OK. All right. So the, we'll close this as reviewed and close 29.15. And uh, UN, can I ask you to open an issue on the unmeeting on RTP issue? Yep. All right. Thanks. All right. So moving on. Um, Another one was to review, uh, the, and this is across different specs, obviously. So this is, I should say, this is in the uh, media capture transform spec. We have a video track generator, but it seems in good shape. Mute and unmute is controlled by JavaScript, basically, through a muted attribute. And uh, the source track uh, that is generated is ended when the source writable is closed. So this seems, and constraints uh, are uh, covered already in that I don't, yeah, there, there were a couple. So here I propose this close as reviewed. Harald is not here, but uh, I'm not proposing any change here. So I think this is good. Any thoughts? Otherwise, uh, I'll move on. Any questions? Sounds good. All right, so now we're <clears throat> getting a little more interesting here with element capture. So this is in media capture from element, which has two parts. There's capture stream of um, HTML video and audio elements. <clears throat> and then we'll deal with the canvas later. So this is just the element capture spec, which has the most language about muted. Um, it specifies when to end the track, which is good. It's basically when the ended uh, when playback ends, the ended event on the element, which is separate from our ended. Um, and uh, basically, so when a track that it captures is no longer selected or enabled for playback. Now, of course, a media element can be assigned new things to, to play, uh, and the load algorithm runs again, but then that is not picked up. You have to call capture stream again, basically. Um, so um, what's less, what I, <clears throat> the language I found a little strange is that it uses language like, uh, for mute and unmute, it uses terms like available content, which is a reactive mode, uh, and accessible when it talks about same origin and cross origin. And so I propose to add a PR to clarify that a little more. And from what I could tell, the intent here seems to be to carry forward any state from when the source is a media stream track. So if you do a videos.source object equals media stream that contains a, a video track, for example, it's the intent here seems to have been that if, if that track is muted, or if that track is disabled, for instance, then should this should this state be carried forward? But there's a question there. Um, should it then be muted if it's disabled and stuff like that? Um, so 
Ivan? Um, yeah, I, I, as far as I know, it's only implemented it in Chrome. So I, I don't know if you played with uh, with Chrome or if uh, somebody in the Chrome team knows what's happening there. And it, it might be useful to to look at what is being done there to mm. define what is implemented and if we agree with this. Um, in general, it seems to me that when uh, content is uh, tainted, it stays tainted. So there's no way to untaint it, except maybe to restart uh, uh, a video streaming, which means that the playback will end and will restart. So I guess the captured media stream track will end. So maybe you can simplify things and uh, end the track when whenever the content gets uh, gets gets tainted. Uh, so there might be simplifications, but it, b before doing that, it would be uh, good if we can uh, precisely discover what uh, Chrome is doing. Okay, I should mention Firefox does have an implementation. Uh, it's it's currently called Moz Capture Stream uh, because we had some differences with specs still. So it might still be interesting. Uh, you know, not not so much for web combat, but there might be web pages that that do a if no capture stream and then must capture stream or uh, and stuff like that. Okay. All right. So, so um, probably, probably you, you know the behavior of Firefox there. And uh, that, that would be also interesting to, to have in the issue. Right. Yeah. So I'm not fully up on the exact details of it. And uh, in fact, just as I was writing these slides, uh, after I wrote these slides, uh, it occurred to me that uh, while it might make sense that if the source track is muted, the destination track should be muted. Uh, you know, it's less obvious that if you, well that from that, if the source track is disabled, should the destination track be muted? It would kind of be, it, it would kind of have to be because it'd be a little bit weird if it interfered with the destination track enabled states. Um, so anyway, uh, the proposal here is to provide a PR basically. Um, then we could try to address some of these things. Um, but otherwise, uh, no implementation defined behavior was detected here. Uh, that was on, that seemed to be on purpose. So if our cleanup, if our further testing reveals more differences, I guess we can come, come back and discuss those. All right. I'm happy with that as a conclusion, unless there's other thoughts about this. Okay, uh, next slide, uh, same for Canvas Capture Stream. Um, it only mentions mute once <coughs> related to no longer being origin clean. And just like we just talked about origin clean uh, for elements, it's a little different because I think Canvas, uh, if uh, Canvas becomes dirty, I guess you can clear it and then it becomes origin clean again. Um, so that's a little weird, perhaps. So the current language says that if it becomes, if it's no longer origin clean, then uh, must become uh, muted in that state. So um, it doesn't say anything about ended or unmute. Uh, it should clarify if events are fired and there's no mention of constraints. There is an open issue found. Um, on this, now issue number 82, clarify if Canvas media stream track mute, unmute and ended events are expected to be fired. So the proposal here is just to close this review issue, issue 99 as a dupe of 82, and conclude that no implementation defined behavior is allowed. Uh, what's detected basically, in, as far as intent. If there are any vendors who, who now, otherwise, of any behavior here that they want to preserve, please let us know. Any thoughts? You want? Yeah, proposal seems good to me in general. Uh, I think we, we should look at uh, origin clean. Uh, I can look at some of implementation, but my my understanding is that when the canvas is tainted, the, can, the canvas stays stay tainted and it's, uh, it's over. But may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's a way to. Uh, Clean it, um, but uh, if not, then maybe we should consider ending 
the track. Uh, I'm, I do not remember what exactly Safari is doing there in terms of uh, when it gets dirty. Uh, certainly, mm -hmm. we are not uh, sending new video frames, but I, I, I don't remember, remember. Probably we are muting the track, but I, I'm not sure. So I can check that. All right. Uh, next on queue is uh, Google. Yeah, it's tough. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, is is it off in the queue? Yes. Yeah, yeah, please yes. speak. Okay. Uh, now, well, in Chrome, uh, I think uh, the muting behavior is based on if we're not producing frames, we'll mute. So follow, inherit them from from the parent. But I think that matches what we want to do here. And this, except that, uh, so basically, if, if we are uh, uh, out origin clean, we don't produce frames, so we want to mute. So that's compatible with, with, the, with the old definition. So, uh, at least the practice is very compatible with that. What happens if you call capture stream with zero, which is a mode where I think it's only supposed to produce uh, frames if you draw when you draw to the canvas? So yeah. what if the JavaScript yeah, application? I, I, I think it, I think if you never draw and never produce a frame, it will it will it will be muted too. Mm. Okay, so this this is the uh, behavior that I think we would like to clarify, because yeah. uh, I don't believe uh, other implementations mute in that case. Yeah. Uh, so so if my application doesn't draw a frame on the canvas for one second. It would see different behavior in different browsers. Some would fire the mute event, and others would not. Is this something that we can hope to to uh, align with? Yeah, yeah, we should. Yeah. Sorry, I Guido, I didn't hear you. Yes, yes, yes. We we, we should align here. And define this but yeah again I mean it's uh like actually changing the implementation yeah we need to follow uh, a process and what we need to see but I don't think in this particular case it will be uh, a big problem but if it is then then we'll file an issue uh, against this okay all right cool so you're good with closing this as a dupe of uh the other issue, but then uh, we're saying no implementation defined, no implementation defined behavior allowed. You're good with that. Yeah. All right. Great. That sounds good. Uh, okay. Just, just to say thoughts? that, yeah, we we should add tests that uh that are adding uh that are things in canvas uh, canvases. Yeah. I looked at Safari's implementation, so Safari is not finding mute and mute. It's not ending the track. Uh, it's just not um um exposing video frames. So there's no video frame generated, basically. And right. uh, I, I don't see how you can uh, clean a dirty canvas. Uh, but maybe uh, it was with a, a short look. But uh, so maybe we can simplify. Uh, I guess mm -hmm. this could be like different issues. Uh, so I, I can, yeah, I can I can file them, I guess. Or can we use Night nine, I don't know. Okay, no, that that's a that's a good idea. I I prefer uh, some of these issues when I looked at them were pretty old, and it wasn't always clear. So if you know if, if you if you're able to file a new issue with more clarity in language, that would be awesome. Okay, we'll do it. Sir. In that case, maybe we can uh, close out more of the issues. All right. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this one? Okay, all right, so I'm going to the next one. This is uh, in web audio, <laughs> that's the last one. Uh, th there's no action here basically because it's a different working group, but there's no mention of muted, ended, or constraints for media stream audio destination nodes track. Um, and so basically if a, if a media stream audio destination node track is never muted or enabled and cannot be constrained with apply constraints, this is now the default behavior. 
but it might be good to call out if this is intentional. This is our advice basically to the audio working group. Uh, for instance, something like the media, audio, media stream audio destination node stream track is never muted or ended and has no constraints. So no action, just uh, mentioning it here for, for thought since this is the working group that has the most experience with with these uh, states in um, and if this makes if this makes sense as far as advice to the audio working group and do we have any thoughts on whether uh Ewan? yeah i think it makes sense uh i, I don't really know whether we want to end the track uh maybe or, or mute it when the audio context is uh, suspended and unmute it when it resumes. Hmm. Um, I, I don't really know. Um, nobody asked for it, so uh, I would guess right. uh, it's okay to to not do any work there. But if there's a terminal action in web audio, then maybe we could uh, suggest another uh, firing of the ended. Perhaps. Um, yeah, if the, if the working group has a consensus on a position, then we should definitely uh, send it to the audio working group. Um, so, yeah. but I, I don't have a, a position currently, at least. There, yeah, maybe others have. Okay. And to clarify, I opened this issue on the web audio spec, so uh, uh, that's why I'm suggesting to leave it open. But. Uh, Folks here are welcome to to comment on it uh, if they're part of that working group, I guess, or even as guests. All right, I think that was my last slide on the review part. See how am I on time here? Oh, we're good. Time is fine. All right, cool. So this is uh, in Media Capture Record. Um, it's an old issue about MIME type ambiguity, uh, mostly in Firefox. So the following code works in Chrome, but throws not supported error in Firefox because uh, audio, code, audio codec not mentioned, basically. So the issue is this was discovered recently by uh, some users who were inquiring about why Firefox was working differently. And so the issue here is that the application is asking it's getting both user media, both audio and video. And then it's trying to record that stream that contains audio and video. But it specifies in the MIME type, it specifies uh, WebM codex equals VP8. Um, but it doesn't say comma opus. So when you do that, and when you forget to add comma opus, uh, Firefox will complain. And, and throw not supported error, whereas Chrome, I believe, will then uh, still encode audio and video and use VP8 for video, and it will use whatever the default audio codec it has it, it for audio, which is what exactly the same codec it would have used if you hadn't passed in MIME type at all. And that actually seems better to me because that MIME type overrides the browser's default codecs seems natural and intuitive. But if we, if we follow the spec language and Firefox, uh, Firefox also treats it as an input selector effectively, which seems redundant, uh, especially when there are better ways to exclude audio if that's what you meant. You can basically uh, take out just a video track from a media stream and record that and put it in a new media stream. Sorry, take out the video track, put it in a new media stream and record that media stream. And then that's an explicit way to say, I don't want the audio. And that also works the same whether you're relying on a default, whether you're specifying MIME type or relying on the defaults for codecs. So in other words, input filtering and codec overriding are orthogonal, which seems better. So the proposal here is to align the spec with the current Chrome behavior. I, I did not test Safari because it told me no VP8. So uh, I'm not quite sure how that works in a similar situation there. You in? Yeah, that, that sounds good to me to align the spec with saying, hey, given like the the defaults that are selected plus uh, 
the specific codec, then use the default audio codec if uh, if needed. Um, the power is using is not supporting webhead as a container. It's using MP4. So depending on the container, maybe uh, the uh, depending on the selected container, maybe the uh, audio codec will be different. I guess, but that that could be uh, that could be PR somehow. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I should have uh, updated my uh, example there to the query safari behavior better. <clears throat> um, any other thoughts on this one? I'm assuming uh, Chrome team agrees, since it's aligning <laughs> spec with uh, Chrome behavior. Yeah, we agree. Yeah, perfect. All right, in that case, uh, we're done early. Cool, over to Guido. Yes. Okay, so I'll talk about the uh, encoded source. So, yeah, uh, the scenario here is that I want to run the proposed API is not necessarily exclusive for, for this scenario, but I want to present the scenario so it's very clear uh, what the motivation is. Uh, or why we want to propose it this way. So uh, you have a, a server that is providing the media via peer connections, and you have uh, a lot of nodes uh, that are going to receive that media, but they don't want to connect all of them to the server. So there, there could be thousands, but you want to connect only a few to the server. And uh, so, so you do that and then you, build a, a peer to peer system with with all those nodes and you create a topology using redundant paths for reliability because the, these nodes are generally unreliable they can join and leave at any time because the user is not interested in in the content anymore they can leave and then uh, they need to rebalance the the uh, the graph uh, so that maintain the appropriate level of redundancy. Uh, and the idea is to support a glitch-free for forwarding of the media throughout the graph uh, such that these unreliable nodes don't, don't constantly cause interruptions in in the media uh, that uh, is received by the nodes that are re that remain in the, the in the system so uh, so you could say that that we want to solve uh, not only fan out but also fan in as, as uh, geneva uh, mentioned in in the in the issue where, where we have been discussing this on github Go, go to next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so, so the proposal, uh, so yeah, we, we discussed this and the idea is to have a concrete proposal. Now I, I sent a peer for you. We, we have iterated a bit uh, by discussing via GitHub and in the editor's meeting and, and yeah, the, the process has evolved to basically match the pattern of uh, encoded transform, except that in this case, instead of uh, a transform, will be just a source. So, so it will only have a writable part. And uh, the way you would write the code is something like this: you create a worker, you uh, create a source, uh, you pass the worker and give the name similarly to the script transforms that are indicated uh, below uh, you want to use the encoded source for the sender so to forward and to get the input you use script transforms uh, from the receivers uh, of the incoming peer connections uh, so all the interesting action occurs on the worker so it's in the next slide and yes, so yeah. Well, this is a very simplified uh, code. So 
like in a real production, you, you will have to deal with, with other things. But uh, the gist of it is that you uh, you have a, a stream to write uh, to the encoder source or to, to write frames to the, uh, to the node that you want to forward to. And there could be one, there could be more. So, so yes, uh, there could be as many as, as the topology uh, of the peer-to-peer -peer system requires. And, and you have transforms uh, from, from the receivers that you use to read the frames. And um, the idea is that uh, each transform is, from the point of view of the receiver, is a pass-through. So you just uh, read the frame and, and queue the frame. But you also analyze the frame and decide if you need to forward it. Uh, so you need to write it to, to the source. And if you do, so there's a, a function, an application defined function called shoot forward, which is like, okay, if you're ready, since uh, all, all, the, all the connections are sending the same data, you would say, okay, this, this frame already sent it, so we can drop it. So we don't need to send it. So don't worry, but if you should forward it, uh, then you create a new frame uh, using the same payload as the original frame, so based on the original frame, but uh, with updated metadata first that is uh, uh, appropriate for the uh, forwarder or for the node to which the data is going to be forwarded, and you just write it to the source, and that's it. So it's up to the application to define when it should forward uh, or how it should forward, how it should deal with uh, the churn in the nodes and so on. Uh, so yeah, our intent here is to provide an API to support the use case, not to solve all those problems that can be solved at, at the application levels. Yeah, so, so basically the, the, the proposal here is the, the encoded source object and the construct for the uh, video and audio friends. And that's it. So let's uh, go to the next slide. Okay, so this, yeah, this is the, the API shape. So we, we have an encoded source, which was we saw there. The, the worker you receive an encoded source controller that has a writable stream and maybe some other things like for congestion control, which has as a proposal that we can use both for this and for encoded transform. And we have the event to, to get the controller and we add a, a, an overload for replace track to the sender so that we can tell it to send the content from the source. So the, the source would act as a sort of a, a track that has encoded frames. And well, yeah, so, so the point of view of API shape, yeah, this, this is it. This basically follows the pattern of encoded transform, which is um, yeah, uh, uh, it's nice to to have it uh, this way because then we can uh, treat the common things the same in both cases. So let, let's go to the next slide, uh, please. To... So the pros and cons are well. I think uh, having the following the same patterns and code transform is a pro because then yeah, it makes it easy to evolve both APIs in parallel. Uh, we can extract common things in maybe some super interfaces sometimes. Uh, and we can use the, the same approach for bandwidth, bandwidth congestion following. Harold uh, has an initial proposal, uh, at least at the explainer. And uh, uh, build some existing APIs that are already deployed in production. 
And it's a good match for the SFU light operations that are frame centric. So, so this example that I provided would be like the zero timeout uh, glitch free forwarding of frames from the downtown paths, which is it's, um, it's a very interesting application because it, it's automatic failover without timeouts, which is like not, not that common in, in this type of uh, peer to peer distributed system. Uh, and like, uh, also for when the decision is, I would want to drop frames uh, from certain layers and respond to bandwidth issues in the system. Yeah, that that this is a good match for them. Uh, the disadvantage, uh, of course, as, as that has uh, already been mentioned in previous discussion, is that uh, yeah, it, it it requires waiting for a full frame before forwarding, which introduces extra latency uh, compared with a uh, packet based API. Uh, but in this case, I would say that this is just uh, uh, a different trade off uh, that better supports this type of use case. Uh, and it doesn't preclude having a packet based API, which is also under discussion. Uh, and such an API would be based for, for other use cases. Uh, but it would certainly not not be as friendly or, or as ergonomic uh, as this one for the for the zero timeout uh, forwarding uh, zero zero timeout failover uh, literally forwarding uh, from redundant paths. So yeah, that's. Uh, uh, what I want to say. So the next slide is just uh, so that we can have a discussion and that uh, so we, we have been discussing this and iterating on the API shape. The question is, um, do we have rough consensus on going on with this? Uh, or yeah. come so see that thing is in the queue. Yeah, so so I, I like this. I think this is interesting. Um, I have some worry that it's not obvious how you will know that it's the same frame from multiple sources. Like you, you've got a like a, a nice nice little um, what was it universal metadata get, um, which is a lovely idea. But I, I wonder like how that will work if it's been filtered through. Like it's taken five routes to get here. Like, how will you preserve the uniqueness of that metadata? But and I, well, basically, what I'm saying there is, I think we may need an API or a specification as to what that metadata looks like for what you're doing to actually work. But I like it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Remember that, uh, like, a lot of this is under the control of the application, and by application, I mean not only the JavaScript but the whole system. So we're talking here about, um, like, a, a peer to peer systems also. So you could use some mechanisms to facilitate, uh, the, so to make everything work together. So the the, the shoot forward function. Uh, can use any existing APIs or any other system specific communication to, to make those decisions. So, so we, yeah. we don't necessarily need to solve everything at the level of this that this spec is operating. I mean, we can solve some things like in other specs to better support certain use cases, and other parts can can be solved by by the application using using other mechanisms. Yes, to totally agree, but but what I'm worried about is whether you need whether you're going to need to add to the frame metadata in a way in 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 a way to make this work. Whether there's going to be and you need to have that visible at the right time. And we sort of looked at this before with encoded transform that the metadata you needed to to achieve it. Like there was quite a lot of discussion about what that was and and when it should be available and when it was valid and things like that. And I think we. I can flagging up that we'll have to have the same discussion here. One of the advantages of having this at the frame level is that we have header extensions like the dependency descriptor, which will survive through hops and through different SFU paths. So that might give us some of this, maybe. 
yeah exactly and but are those valid are those visible in the worker like is there an api to get at them um it's not obvious to me that there is and i you don't want to be kind of digging into the frame to try and pull those out it, it, or maybe you do i don't know Oh, so things might you know, some may, some things might not be super ergonomic, so we can add additional APIs to make those things easier. Uh, next thing here to you, Arne. Yes. So overall, I think the API shape is fine. Um, for use cases, also fine. Uh, maybe we can refine a little bit the names and so on, but uh, I don't think it's uh, the right time for that. Um, I, so the main thing maybe uh, to make it work is uh, in Encoded Transform, we decided to not go in that world and have a very strict model. So it was very difficult to end up into an error. In this case, on the contrary, you can start sending whatever you, you want like some funky data, too much data, uh, data that is uh, too small so that you cannot ramp up uh, and so on. So there are plenty of things that are different. And we we need to be able to um, precisely signal to the web application, hey, something is wrong there uh, in the data that you're sending and in, in a timely manner. And so we need to expose all those things. Um, so we need to define the model like it's an encoder basically so we need to define what this encoder plus the track that is uh, behind it how it's functioning so i think it's a good exercise and then we might we can uh, with this model with this api model we can add further apis to uh, expose more of uh, the errors and so on so i'm i'm positive it will uh we, we we can fix that but uh, we we should really do that work early on and not let, leave it to hey here is the api it should sort of work and then we will figure out what the error model is and what the web application needs we really need from the start to to dig into into that place yes i i think uh, the proposal that Harold sent that has signals from like uh, bandwidth congestion th things like that uh, it's a good place where we can also uh, at least uh, uh, um, yeah. think about some of the issues uh, with this model, which are so to this and yeah, yeah. For instance, we should make sure we 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 add them. Yeah. For instance, we should list all the other cases that we can think of, um, and then. Uh, decide whether we want to uh, agree to it or whether we want to signal that it is okay, whether we want to drop the data on the floor and, and things like that. Uh, so that we have a proper model. It will help us define the model and define the API as well from the start. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, okay. oh. so we're we're adding uh, this as an alternative to uh, a track and replace track, and I'm wondering whether there's some additional work that's going to be implied by that, um, like uh, you know whether other parts of the system are always assuming it's a track and now it's not a track, so um, you know are stats affected other things. I, I think uh, in that case, since this is actually similar, very similar to a track, uh, probably just need to to make the proper clarifications in in, in the text because uh, uh, I think that uh, except for the fact that it's not a mainstream track from the uh, from the point of view of the system is is very similar so so we we, we just need to identify the parts where 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 the fact that it's already encoded is, is a problem for 
uh, for the um, uh, for the existing algorithms. But uh, at least in the in the the initial proposal I made, I, I mentioned several parts that yeah that are like monkey patches, but the monkey patches are not are not like significant changes it's, it's they're mostly like if it's a source or a track not 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 really uh, at least in my, my, my initial past I, I didn't i didn't identify anything where we're having uh, an encoded source would, would significantly disrupt uh, yeah, the other parts of, of, of the system yeah, I was just wondering, like, if it would track events necessarily pass through, because one of the one of the things we've seen, right, is when you kind of go through, uh, that often data gets dropped. I'm just wondering, like, we just had this discussion of, you know, track ended and stuff, and are there equivalents in this? No. Uh, just trying to think through whether whether it all has a, or even there there. Are, treatment of replace track, right? It differs depending on the state of the track. So um, anyway, yeah. Yeah, that, that, the, and these are all minor issues that just like UN said, just want to make sure it's thought through. Yeah, yeah we can uh, think about it, but I think uh, at least the, the, the track signals are not much of a problem here because we, we are, we would be like the source of a invisible track that's there. So. It's different from say if this were a remote track, where we would need to worry more about the to signal correctly in the track, like certain things that are happening. If I may, um, just on one point, Bernard, you you mentioned the impact for related to stats, and the earlier proposal was to reuse WebRTC and Codic Transform, and there it was very difficult to understand whether. The encoded transform was a source or not, and the stats would uh, be somehow meaningless. Um, with this new API, at least the web application is uh, letting know the user agent that it's a source, and then all the track stats, for instance, the user agent can say, "Okay, it's uh, it's a no op." So maybe I will we will be able to to define that they should not be there, for instance, if the source is set and there's no track uh, and things like that. So I, at least we will be able to, to precisely define the behavior for uh, some of these APIs that are uh, impacted, which is, uh, which is a benefit. All right, I think I'm next on the queue. Uh, so uh, overall, thank you uh, for explaining the use case. And, and it, it's quite an ambitious and advanced use case, it seems. Uh, and so I wouldn't... <clears throat> Uh, but I applaud your approach here for looking for the, the smallest pieces that are needed, and I think this is the right direction. Uh, it, it, but it does also raise a lot of questions, I guess. Like Bernard mentioned, uh, we just we just added stats to media stream track, for example. Uh, is this going to uh, open up? This sounds like more of the beginning of a direction, so I'm a little concerned with, you know, we're going to add bandwidth APIs and all the other things that we have to add. But as far as this step, I think this step looks reasonable for introducing the sender encoded source. And I like the API shape. Um, it, it does make me wonder, um, but as far as for the constructor for the encoded video frame, and I'm assuming you mean audio frame, um, I have a question about, um, we're kind of repurposed. The, uh, a lot of the SFU-like logic will still be done in the in the transform, <clears throat> where we're dealing with uh, RTC encoded video frame, which was optimized toward encode de encrypt, decrypt, and add metadata cases, where the array buffer is read-write. So it's a little unclear to me still whether when you create a new RTC encoded video frame from the original, does that copy the array buffer or not? So that's one question I had. But <laughs> I think you should, since it's a new, a completely new separate frame. Of course, you could implement it with copy on write if necessary, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. And also, uh, on a larger question, I guess, uh, have you thought about uh, are there other potential sources for uh, sender encoded sorts, like 
a web codex, for example, um, which we talked a little bit about on GitHub. Uh, you uh, imagine that being useful there as well? Yes, 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 there could be, of course. <laughs> of course, of right. course, there could be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we would need to work on on a better integrating uh, web codex, uh, the encoded chunk, and, and this. But uh, I guess it, it would be basically uh, integrating encoded chunks with uh, encoded uh, with uh, RTC encoded frames. Right. And... So other questions I have, and these are not necessarily blockers. I think this is the right direction, but uh, it's sort of like um, if, uh, like in your example, if you have this fan out, the fan in, I can't imagine if one node early up in the one of the forwarding nodes ends up being on the cell phone, for example, that has specific codec needs. Uh, you lose the ability here to uh, re-encode, I guess, but that's an application decision, I guess. Uh, that's uh, That would be an application node decision. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think I like the design. I guess uh, I'm wondering what happens to the uh, sender when the sender has less control over uh, are you still imagining um, decisions like dropping a simulcast layer and those kind of things to be happening, or is this just merely packet forwarding? Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I would guess. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, we 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 need to have like like Jan said. I mean, uh, proper signals. If you're if you're doing something wrong, so that so that uh, you know that you're doing something wrong. Uh, since of course this makes it easier to do something wrong. Uh, but uh, yes, I mean decisions that we decide to drop a frame for some reason because it's uh, from a layer and so on. I mean, you 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 have to have proper if you're doing it in a way that. That doesn't make sense for 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 the system, uh, but uh, yeah. So so that's basically what we need to to make sure that okay. Like uh, what what are the things that can be easily done wrong so that we we have proper uh, yeah. Of course we have a, a mechanism which would be like rejecting the promise of the right, but uh, yeah, we probably need more uh, more signals. Uh, but uh, yeah, we can, we can iterate on those. Uh... All right, thanks. Yeah, I think uh, there's bound to be some follow up on this, but I think uh, rough, roughly this uh, looks promising to me. So Anyone else on the queue? Yes. We have a uh, technique. Uh, so, like, do you have an idea? Like this get unified metadata or like this constructor, the metadata, I, I guess I have a similar concern to Tim. Like, do you have an example of what would be passed into the metadata? Like, what type of data? Yeah, well, you might need to write the frame IDs because you're, you're getting the data from multiple preconditions that have different frame IDs, but you want to send a consistent frame ID to the output, for example. You want to, to write the metadata in that case. Okay. And the application needs to, need to, um, it needs to know what, what metadata. But this is yeah, it's using does, the existing where does defined the method. Where does the information come from? Well, the application is to is, is to know it. I mean, it's 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 it's, it's, to, it's up to the application to, to yeah. But I'm thinking in this uh, scenario where you have a bunch of different nodes, well, they are they're both sender receivers. On the send side, how would you know? Kind of like I mean, are we relying on a particular you know blessed uh, RT extension being used for this information be there? Right. Because there are streams, you know, without frame this, there are streams uh, that rely on other mechanisms. There are a bunch of different descriptors. I mean, it, it would be up to the application to decide what to Yeah, but I'm saying that you have to kind of, like, if you want the application to make a decision, the application needs the information in the first place. And that's kind of what I'm curious about. Like, if what information could the application possibly put into the metadata? Because, you know, it also comes down to what the information does the application need to have access to. So I guess, my, as I said, my, my concern is very similar to the team. Or teams concerned, not really. I I kind of get what you're saying that you would want to set sort of metadata, but let's see where you get that information from. We'd be using the already specs um, RC encoded video frame metadata 
dictionary, right? Which has that, a does, it like, does, does, it, uh, does it depend? You know, does it have a string dependency on the dependency script? Like the, yeah, we add, okay. yeah, we we added the clarification in the spec. Right. So the, the, this the, the the frame ID is there if and only if there's a dependency to script a header extension. Okay, so if we weren't using the pen scripter, then there would be no frame ID. Pretty sure. Right. So if we were to update the pen scripter and launch a new one, this would break, or you, know, you wouldn't have the information. You would have to like you know in Chrome. I, no, I, I don't think so. It, it has basic info that it's not as specific. It doesn't have like chains and stuff like that. Right. Okay. Anyway, we we can talk more about the metadata. But. Yeah. Yes. So I think just overall, the, there's bound to be new issues to be found here since we have a new type of. We have to figure out how the sender without a track works, and you know, does it do all the set parameters on the sender still make sense? And uh, so I'm a little worried. You know, in some sense, it's kind of like. Pouring premium fuel into my regular car might be fine, but if I pour diesel in, that might not be so fine. So hopefully, and we can uh, get the peer connection to send no matter what the uh, you know if people send in you know four K frames here. I guess it'll just try to do something its best. I, I thought I saw another hand on the queue, but it went away. Are we? At the end of the queue, I think I think it was this one. So. Yeah. All right. Okay. Any other thoughts on this issue? Uh, Yonira, you you are mentioning web codecs, and uh, I think that for testing purposes and uh, you know, yeah, we should definitely use a lot of web codecs to plug uh, whatever is the output uh, to the encoded source and. And see what's happening and so on. But that seems uh, easy, and that seems like uh, a good uh, a good test plan. All right. Yeah, I agree. Should generate lots of bugs. Sorry, I guess one. Yeah, one follow up is like to also make a proposal for encoded creating and artificial encoded frames from encoded chunks. So to me, that'd be a good thing to explore. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I, sh I guess we should ask anyone think that's not a good idea and say so now. <laughs> All right. Uh, Peter? I think it's a fantastic idea. Give us constructors that can create these frames from scratch. All right. That sounds great. Thank you. All right. I think um, any other thoughts on this issue? Otherwise, we can move to the next issue. All right, all good. So here we have WebRTC extended use cases. So then, Shidar, excuse me. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, we are uh, we are going to present uh, two PR related with uh, WebRTC extended use case for the game streaming. Uh, we've been uh, proposed these uh, ideas since last TPEN meeting in July and also follow up this question on december and this is third uh third time we uh, present we are going to present some ideas to make uh use case more clear for the game streaming uh can you go to the next slide so first uh proposal is about uh, configurable uh, artist p uh, feedback interval so we would like to have a way to control the feedback interval for different applications, for different use cases. So our proposal is the application uh, need to have a control uh, of the uh, RTSP feedback interval. Uh, that is the overall uh, proposal for packet loss and packet reception timing. Uh, can you go to the next slide? 
So a little bit details, we had uh, this question through GitHub. So uh, one of the questions we had uh, previously is about how, uh, what is the direction of this configuration. We are trying to propose uh, more details in later, but uh, in uh, the current idea is the direction should be either way. It can be uh, faster or slower uh, depending on the use cases. But we need to have a, uh, some kind of uh, explicit uh, control of the interval. And also the degree of control might be a millisecond or uh, RTCP timestamp changes. Uh, more detailed syntax we propose to the IEPF. So we can propose, we, we would like to make, make sure all the detailed implementation as a follow-up. But this is about the uh, requirement and we want to make sure why we need and what is the benefit of this uh, requirement in the next slide. Can you go to the next? So the benefit perspective, uh, we have uh, kind of improved our responsiveness based on the bandwidth or the performance of the network. So we can improve the, we can uh, gather the information more uh, adaptively based on the uh, situation and based on the application. So that is the uh, benefit of this PR. And uh, also, for example, like L4S, it need much more slower uh, interval, like level of RTD round the trip time for make it better or more uh, effectiveness of this implementation as uh, as it already uh, described in the spec. So uh, there are more and more uh, applications require more control on this interval. So we believe this might be, uh, this uh, requirement make other uh, WebRTC applications, including the game streaming, get the advantage of these uh, changes. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So the, for the discussion, uh, yeah, again, we want to have a control on the interval as we described. Also, I want to highlight that this is the requirement. Uh, so we may want to follow more technical discussion through the working, working group discussion. But at, as of today, we would like to have this requirement uh, at the game streaming, as a game streaming uh, specific requirement. Uh, any feedback or uh, comment? Yeah, Tim? Yeah, so um, I understand the need. I can see, totally see the point. Um, I'm bothered about milliseconds. I think it's a, um, it's not the measure. I, I, I feel like it needs to be tied to the frame interval. It needs to relate to the, t the frame interval rather than the, um, than an absolute time. I think that would make it more kind of, I think it would make, more, make it more sensitive to other changes that might be happening in the system, whereas a fixed um, fixed frame, fixed milliseconds may be completely inappropriate as the system changes behavior. But I mean, that's, uh, I think that's a detail rather than, um, I, I, you know, I like the, the general um, thing. Yeah, thanks. Uh, on our yeah, I'm trying to understand the point about L4S. Could you go back? Um, and I know other people who may be looking at L4S or implementing it. I know UN, Apple has done it. Just trying to. Uh, can you go next slide? Uh, yeah. A little more. 44. Yeah, so 
you know, you're say in a game streaming app, you're, I mean, L4S is certainly very interesting, but you're, mm -hmm. you're sending it back, you're getting the congestion experience through, say it gets integrated through transport CC or whatever. Why can't the browser just do what it needs to do to, to get it? I'm just trying to understand the, the need for a control here. Um, I mean, Yuen, can you help me? Is there a reason that Apple can't do L4S today? Because there isn't enough support in WebRTC API? I I'm just scratching my head here. Um, yeah, I, I had the, the same question. I was wondering whether if, if the, us the user agent knows that L4S is in, in use, it, it, it might send and, and receive. Uh, right. um, so in that case, uh, I would guess that with the IETFs, you negotiate things. And uh, I was wondering, with this knob, uh, what is the application trying to say? Um, maybe the user agent can set the parameter, and that would be best for all type of applications, whether game streaming or with a regular video conferencing. So that, that was the question I had, which, which is, what is making uh should we have two different parameters for game streaming or regular video conferencing given uh a, a set of network with uh and negotiating parameters but that's not totally clear to me yeah i mean yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of work to do l4s you know mm -hmm. obviously a lot of internal stuff like the feedback but but that i mean that's work that has I mean, you could say that's a requirement. You should support L4S or something. But you know, once it's done, I, I don't know that there's a config to do. But go ahead. Yeah, that's that's right. Uh, we think different application may have a different uh, interval configuration. So the reason I uh, make an example of L4S, it's it is require rather. A smaller interval than uh, video conference, as far as I know. In general, video conference. So, I think uh, maybe it's just one example. Uh, but in other use cases, like better uh, congestion control, or maybe the the next item may be related with uh, video recovery in low condition all different cases may have a different parameter. We don't know the detail. We don't, uh, we, we don't assume at this moment of, at this uh, moment of time, we, we cannot say one parameter can solve every uh, solution, but maybe we can figure out more details. But at, at this moment, uh, we at least want to have a control uh, from the application uh, to set some certain value and to meet the application performance. Uh, I'm yeah, looking I, at RFC 888, uh, which is the 8888, sorry, which mm -hmm. is a document that also talks about L4S and stuff. And it says there's a trade off between speed and accuracy reporting and overhead. So that's you know the amount of RTC bandwidth that you're spending also to send all these reporting blocks and, and stuff like that. Um, so that, you know, that's also something to think about, particularly um, in a scenario where the game streaming client, right, it may have this tremendous downlink, hundreds of megabits, but uh, only a few megabits upstream, right? So you're starting to send uh, mm -hmm. all of this huge amount of RTCP feedback. So anyway, it's, it's just to say that the feedback isn't free. So thank you. So, so my comment was just that um, as a use case as a whole, I think game, I think uh, game streaming sounds great. Uh, I definitely think we should support that. Uh, so it comes down to the individual requirements, I guess. Um, I have some concerns in that some of these, this is an area where user agents, I think so far have been left to, to make these choices. Uh, so I'm wondering, so I'm a little worried about whether the, requirements can be specified in a way that allows user agents to um, 
to uh, to meet them um, without necessarily tying the hands of a user agent by exposing an API and making it the application's sole domain, so to speak. Um, if there's a way to uh, to balance that somehow in the use cases, maybe the uh, maybe the requirements can be uh, phrased in a way that it doesn't necessarily have to, ro to result in an API shape. Uh, that might be something that we could support, I think. Um, Bernard? Well, in that same kind of vein, Yanivar, I, I think what we're trying to do here, right? Uh, maybe I'm, I don't understand the total scope, but it's basically to stop building queues because you're trying to have a very responsive uh, experience, right? And um, so, you know, certainly something in that vein to say, hey, we're, and you're trying to respond more quickly to congestion, okay? I, I agree with you that that's not something I ne necessarily would expect most developers. Uh, uh, well, a lot of it, it certainly requires a lot of work in the UA to do it. Um, but, but I think that's the overall purpose, right? Is just reducing queuing delays. Uh, am I right here that that's the focus? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I agree on it, some kind of more general statement. I don't know, you know, it, it always depends on what network you're on, right? I mean, if you're right. doing game streaming from halfway around the world, it's it's not gonna be great no matter what. So it feels like this is in response, it, this is in a way saying that the numbers that user agents have picked today are not sufficient for game streaming, sounds like. So have we exhausted the, are you, yeah. you know, so I just want to make sure user agents, are they able to, if they can just do things better for everyone, uh, that well, might there's not a whole bunch of There's a whole bunch of new, new stuff in progress, right? Like L4S, for example, will be great. You know, uh, Apple's done a great job of getting it out there, but it needs to be deployed. I don't know, we're not, you know, and it, it requires work in the UA. I don't think we're saying that, uh, and of course, it, it's hard to motivate the development when it's not deployed yet. So it's kind of this chicken and egg thing. Um, but um, I wouldn't say people are unmotivated to make these changes on their own. Um, you know, understanding which ones have the biggest impact, I think, is useful. Are you okay? Yeah, I would just like to. I'm from uh, Meta. Um, we also have found that we have a need for this type of uh, API. We've made similar changes for TWCC feedback that's maybe more implementation specific. Um, in terms of like a generic API, I feel like our hands are kind of tied by our TCP being restricted to 5% of bandwidth. Um, it would right. be nice if for the game streaming use case, you could maybe have an API to ignore that restriction. Although yeah, I think I mean, the, the, yeah. the, the proposal here seems fine to me as well, but it, it, it's very tied to like TWCC and LibWebRTC, I think. Yeah. I mean, the issue is because connections are so asymmetric, right? Right. You got 500 Easy. down and 5% of that, I, I don't even have 25 megabits up. Right? You basically congest my entire upstream channel. So, Peter? Well, it seems like there are two different kinds of RTCP. There's control messages, and then there's feedback for congestion control. But wouldn't it make sense for feedback for congestion control to not be limited to the 5%? Since the uh, way that you get more or learn what your rate you can send is, is by using that feedback? Well, it just seems like it's a whole different bucket that doesn't really, maybe that well, whole 5% thing doesn't apply. Yeah, if you read 8888 and the other stuff, the problem is it can be a huge amount of feedback because the messages are large. But I mean, I, mean, I agree that it's important, but um, you know, there's there's a whole calculation in the documents about but, about how much bandwidth it takes. But the the only reason you're doing any of that is because you're you're figuring out how much you can send. So 
you could just allocate more of that for the feedback and then give a lower number as your estimate or something like that. Seems It just seems like it's a part of the congestion control mechanism. So it should be thought of as, a, as different than, it, it happens to be RTCP messages, but it shouldn't be thought of as the same category of things as the rest of RTCP. Okay. Yeah, just just to follow up on Bernard's point, I, I think that illustrates exactly why you need a hint, in the sense that you need something. We need this API because there are a lot of use cases where it would be detrimental to do this, like traditional conferencing. You just don't need to over, uh, you know, if the if the sender has got very limited bandwidth and he wants to use it for audio, you don't want to uh, cover it up completely cover it with um, with feedback. But on the other hand, uh, maybe in game streaming, it's actually a sacrifice you're prepared to make to spend half your uplink on on feedback if it keeps your your um, responsiveness on the joystick. So I, I, think, I think that's exactly why we need an API here, because those two use cases are sufficiently different that we need to signal as developers, we need to signal to the user agent which category to drop this problem into. And I said earlier, I'm not sure that saying it in milliseconds is the right answer, but I do think we need an API point here that says like, this is a this is something where, where low latency is of prime importance and, and don't run queues, don't speed up when you play back. Like there's a whole bunch of settings here that are to do with that use case, which are, are inappropriate for all uh, conferencing and appropriate for game streaming and actually some other stuff like live sport um, where you don't you know being up to the minute or, or being being with a constant latency in the betting in world really matters so it's not just that um, anyway that's my my um, little rant Peter yeah just Following up to what Tim said, I, I think it makes sense to have the application be able to choose on the trade-off between responsiveness and amount of bandwidth that's used in feedback messages. Bernard? I like Tim's idea of a hint because it, it lets the UA decide what to do with it. But if it could be specific enough, and we've also been talking about a zillion things here, right? We have the whole jitter buffer target stuff, and but it's all slightly different. So I don't know if we could come up with a set of hints that might be uh, descriptive enough on exactly what you want, and and let the UA do it rather than you know having a app trying to set RTCP you know intervals and stuff like that. Um, that might make some sense. Okay. Uh, so one comment I had just to make progress, like on PR 118, for example, maybe uh, the current text at the requirement N48 that says the application must be able to control the timing of the signaling. Maybe we, if we instead said something like the application must be able to reduce the timing or you know lower the timing of the signaling and leave it a little more vague that maybe they don't get to set a specific milliseconds, but they have some way of influencing the user agent toward uh, use cases like game streaming. Yeah. Would that Sounds work as a way forward? Yeah. Cool. Um, the next one, uh, I know it's time is already uh, limited, but uh, let me quickly uh, share. This is about the video decoding recovery after package loss. So the main proposal is the application must be able to control video decoding uh, continued even after time loss without waiting for the keyframe. So that is the proposal. And uh, we have an open question. Do we have any benefit or do we have an actual piece of, uh, do we, did we see the feasibility? So in the next slide, oh, Nara. Yeah, I mean, uh, I know Philip can speak to this, but 
uh, basically there's underlying work that needs to be done here in the encoding APIs mm -hmm. and so forth. I mean, I think we know that um, uh, basically being able to do this recovery would be good. It is more complicated in the general conferencing case than in the uh, game streaming case. Um, and so that's been the limitation. But, um, you know, uh, there's a variety of proposals that could make this, this better. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, in the next slide, I want to continue the uh, like evaluation uh, and actual real world that, uh, that the idea. So we had a, a actual implementation on native side on Windows and Mac OS, and we tried H264, HVC, and AV1, and utilized the pr custom protocol, uh, like Bernard mentioned, uh, even the encoder side needs some changes uh, but but we have some uh, real world implementation on this and we found a uh, use lower frame size compared to IDR and lower bit on the network uh, with uh, same uh, quality I I attended this on purpose from meta the, uh, last week uh, Meta also shared some results about LTR implementation on uh, Messenger, and the presenter shared that 37% of reduction on keyframe that is already on production. So there, there are some experiment or uh, ongoing implementation. Even though this uh, two implementation is based on the native, but we would like to uh, see the same benefit on the web. Uh, uh, implementation. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So the discussion point in the cloud gaming scenario, uh, in case of one-on-one -on -one communication, we observed the uh, capability improvement on video streaming. Uh, and our goal is to extend this improvement on the browser-based implementation. Also as the same requirement as before, uh, this is requirement we would like to have a more discussion uh, as a follow-up. Yeah, so uh, I mean, there's certainly a lot of work that would go into implementing this, uh, but um, I mean, I guess you could say you want a recovery mechanism other than NAC or RED or FEC, um, you know, uh, and like I, you know, we know, it's been implemented multiple places and it is a useful thing. Um, uh, and it's something to aspire to, I guess. I mean, it's not easy to, to get it done. Um, so there's a lot of work involved, but um, I don't know, Philip, do you want to comment? I mean, Philip's been actually working on an API proposal to make this possible, so. Uh, Uh, Peter, you're on the queue. But uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I think it'd be great if we had support for uh, long-term reference frames, or even better, um, basically support for control over temporal layers in a way that you could do either long-term reference frames or temporal layers with more control over the uh, the dependency pattern. Um, but I would be curious about, and maybe this is related to what Bernard was saying, is how much we want to make that a WebRTC encoder API versus a WebCodex API or both. But in general, long-term reference frame and dependency control, I think, is uh, important API points to have. Yeah, I mean, if it were in WebCodex, for example, it could even bubble up into some of the stuff we were talking about in coded source or whatever. So. Anyway, we should try to drain the queue and probably wrap up. Who's left in the queue? Uh, no one, I think. <laughs> Did we get everyone? So I, I would try to try to uh, put this in in a more general way. Like, don't say you have to do RPSI or something, because that 
you know, that has been problematic. I think a lot of people have tried to implement it and it doesn't work particularly well. Um, but, but something like a recovery uh, reference control or, or uh, re additional recovery mechanisms um, might make some sense. Okay, and all right, with that, I think we're at time. Is that right, Bernard? Uh, it's 10 o'clock on my watch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, we'll see you again next week, I hope, next month. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>